Okay, let's get started. So, as I said about five minutes ago, I've popped you all on mute. Um, we'll leave everyone on mute up until people want to share or put their hands up and ask any questions. Tonight, it is just me. So, you've got Tom Meesham, the club support officer at the County FA, delivering. Normally, I might have two or three of my colleagues with me. We're on a very, very busy week. I know three of my colleagues are currently uh, participating in a football tournament, a charity football tournament. Um, I know that Leon and Claire are on another meeting with Samaritans. So a really busy night for us as a county FA, which is good. It means there's stuff to be getting on with and it means we're out there doing stuff. So just me tonight. So you will have to bear with me a little bit. I'll keep the chat open down the side. Um, I am having to admit people and mute people as we go along too. But hopefully it will be nice and smooth. So tonight is the fifth club update of the season or club dates as we call them. Um, They've been really, really positive experience so far this season, but they have been absolutely kiboshed by COVID. So this meeting um, is in place as a development tool rather than just an information tool. Um, so it's nice this time that the focus isn't just on COVID and I'll get it out there straight away. If you need some support and guidance with COVID, park those questions until the end. Um, and I'll be happy to support and answer. Uh, there will be a section at the end for any questions that aren't covered tonight as well. I know I've had a few come into my inbox. Um, so just me, uh, really, really excited to talk about something other than COVID. Delightful. So perfect pre-seasons is what we've called tonight's meeting. It's all about the closed season, essentially. Um, so what we'll be covering? Affiliation, we'll do a quick blast on that. Um, but it shouldn't take us too long. I don't want to bore you to sleep with affiliation. Then we're going to briefly touch on AGM season, which we're in now, that end of season kind of feel. Constitutions, accounting, consistent committee meetings. And then I've got a two minute spiel on our Euro legacy plan. But that's the aim of the meeting tonight. So let's dive straight into affiliation um, and get this bit out of the way. So firstly, thank you. To those people who've already submitted or had theirs approved, thank you for those that have started and then realised you've got a bit of work to do and have held off. Um, there is absolutely no rush on affiliation this year. We've opened it nice and early, still in the 20, uh, 2021 season, um, because what we didn't want is a bottleneck like last year. And that was unfortunate. We didn't know what was happening. Then it was bang, football's back and get everyone affiliated. And it weeks um, for us as a staff and for you as clubs wanting answers and wanting your affiliation sorted so you could play so we've opened it nice and early to try and smooth that out and it's been really really good so far i'm logging on in the morning with 10 or 15 max whereas last year i was logging on with 150 affiliations a day to review so that's the difference and hopefully that keeps everyone's process kind of quick and slick so really really um pleased with that so far so just a few bits to be aware of that we've changed or are kind of common errors. Firstly, if your club play in a junior league that offers two, team, two, re, uh, two teams, one result as a league, you'll know what that means if that's you. If you don't know what that means, you can maybe just ignore me for the next 20 seconds. You can now affiliate those teams as one. So previously you have had to affiliate them as team one and team two or, or red and green, but it's essentially the same kids and they mix and match and 10 play in the first game and 10 play in the second game. Um, if you are a two teams, one result, please affiliate them as one team. The system will now allow you to add enough players or the amount of players that you have. So from a player edge point, that works. It will also save you on your personal accident insurance and team fees. So please, if it's a double team, only affiliate one team this season. It will save you financially and just put the suffix in double or double team and stop team B from affiliating. So you can cancel and delete them off your affiliation. Multiple club affiliations. We had lots of feedback last year around clubs that affiliate separately for admin purposes, which it's not ideal, but I appreciate that it works for some of you. The problem is if you affiliate three clubs, you will be charged times three if you want to buy our public liability insurance or you have done in previous years. I've managed to resolve that this year. So if you are three or four or two clubs and you affiliate separately but you are the same entity by that i mean you have the same committee you can purchase public liability insurance on one of your affiliations and don't purchase it on the other one and again that should be a saving of either 30 or 60 pounds so if you are one of those clubs, um 
do it that way. So as long as you're operating off the same committee and same um, constitution, just buy the insurance on one of the clubs. It might be worth just shooting us an email if you're not doing it at the same time to say, I purchased the insurance on the adult section to cover adult and junior or purchased the, the um, cover on the girls side, but I want that to cover the boys side too. Like I said, same committee, same constitution you can. If you don't have that, you need to go ahead and buy the public liability insurance if you're getting it through us on both affiliations. Club and team grounds, this is huge for us um, and it's a huge piece of work if we don't get it right at affiliation. So first up, you get the opportunity to list all of your club grounds when you're going through the affiliation. Please add every single venue that your club uses and then you can tick which one is your main but add all of them because later on when you get to your teams it gives you a drop down and you can just select under 10s play it whatever rec, under 11's trainer SGP Thorncliff, and so on and so on. We will not approve any affiliations this year if a team does not have its training and its match venue listed. Now the rationale behind that is it is all linked to funding. Football Foundation, local football facility plans, if we don't have the data of which pitches are being used and which aren't, it makes it very difficult for us to draw funding down to the pitches that need it. So that is absolutely crucial that you take the time to get that bit right for the benefit of everybody. And like I said, I can run a report every day and it will tell me this club are affiliating with that team A, B and C and I'll give you a nudge, I'll push it back and you can go on and add them in for us. Or you can just tell me who, where it is and I'll add that for you. Um, they've really improved the uh, ability to add a new ground to if it's not listed. So as a process, it's fairly straightforward, but we're going to be really strict on that this year. And then just the mandatory qualifications. The standard one that will block it when we try and approve it is your welfare officer is not fully qualified, so therefore they don't have an in-date DBS, the welfare officer course, safeguarding children course, and online safeguarding for committee members. They've got to have those four things, otherwise they are not compliant and we can't affiliate you. The second bit on the mandatory qualifications is any youth teams with a with the coach list that they have to have an in-date DBS that will block your affiliation and finally all committee members of junior clubs have to have the online safeguarding for committee members if any of those things aren't showing against the fan it will automatically block the affiliation from going through so there's no um, ways around it or us to shortcut it we'll have to wait until that is taken care of but like I said there's no real rush um, just common errors we get loads of I probably had five or six today forgetting to upload your personal accident insurance now I appreciate that you are all still in this seasons and you may not have renewed yet. If you've not renewed yet, that doesn't matter. Just don't submit your affiliation until you've got next year's cover. We're affiliating you for next season. So we won't allow you to affiliate with this season certificate on the premise that you're going to purchase it. We have to see next year's cover before we can do it. So if you're not uh, renewed yet, just don't complete your affiliation. You've got plenty of time to pause and hold on to that. So not an issue. Second thing that will always block an affiliation um, or common errors that we, we see are outstanding finance, particularly discipline. Um, so if you've got discipline that's not been paid, we will not put through your affiliation. You have to clear all your club debts before we will put through your affiliation. And that will give us an error message straight away saying club owes £150 for X, Y and Z. And we'll come back to you and say, can you clear that? before now we will show a bit of sympathy if you picked up a yellow card on saturday and you're affiliating on monday we, we'll check it out and if it's just that we'll push your affiliation through but it's more for stuff that's um dated or that is quite serious we have to make sure that that's clear before we can put it through and the biggest problem we had last year and this was awful because it caused a lot of headaches was failing to add your team to their league competition um, so if you don't, it causes you a headache at player reg because you can't register your players because your team aren't in a league. So please take care to ensure you put them in the right competition. It's not your job to put them in a division. It won't even let you do it. But make sure they're in the right league and you just start typing what you think your league's called and it will bring them up, click it and get every single team in. That way, when it comes to player reg, you can crack straight on and you won't be chasing us at the, at the county FA to say, 
Uh, can you add the under 10s to Barnsley Junior League? Can you add the under 12s to the Sheffield Junior League? And so on. So really, really important. I'll send this slide deck out later, um, probably tomorrow morning actually, and there's a link there to a tutorial video um, that we recorded, and there's also a how-to guide. So if you are stuck at any point, all the staff members are well-versed and well-trained, uh, give us a call, drop us an email. Really important that you explain exactly what the problem is rather than asking for help. Just tell us what it is, um, and we can come straight back, and most things we can solve in 10, 20 seconds if we know exactly what you need us to do, okay? So just uh, that's just a recap of the qualifications we covered. Um, last bit on affiliation. Like I said, there's no rush. The season ends on June the 30th, so we've got plenty of time. The only thing I will say is we get asked each year. We will not act, we will not sanction friendly matches. We won't ask you to send in a list of friendly matches that we will sanction. It is your responsibility as a club to ensure that you are affiliated and the team you are playing are affiliated. If you are both affiliated, you are free to pro play friendlies. And I appreciate a lot of you will be playing friendlies in June, which is still this season. So it's all about from July the 1st, ensuring any friendlies or competitions that you go into um, from then are being played between affiliated clubs. So please don't feel the need to send in requests for friendlies. We won't sanction them. It's not something we do. We are putting the onus on you to ensure that you're both affiliated. We will, as the summer goes on, start to put lists up of all affiliated clubs so you can check and challenge anyone that you're coming up against so i kept that down to seven minutes so i'm pleased with that um that is affiliation sorted we'll save any affiliation questions until the end uh, like i said what i don't want is people to uh, to get bored um dealing with affiliation questions that hopefully i can answer quite swiftly for you at the end if you do have anything that's springing to mind now please feel free to stick it in the chat and i will scroll back up uh, and answer those later on but hopefully affiliation should be pretty straightforward for us this year okay so on to the main event if you will for tonight and i'm not gonna lie we've had some meetings with 200 150 120 people on i'm looking at this number now 34 35 and it's it's much more manageable and i'm hoping um that it's going to be a much more beneficial group for everyone and to kind of learn and share from each other so governance why do we need good governance? Sorry, I've got a spinning disc on my screen, so I can't see the slide. There we go. So better ranked clubs. If you are running better and have good governance, it actually becomes less time consuming because you have the processes in place to make everyone's life easy, but you're still being as effective uh, as you were before. Um, so better ranked clubs with better governance, it's less time consuming for you as volunteers. Um, and it will help you retain and attract new players. If the club is running smoothly and is seen to be doing the right things and is acting in the best interest of its members, you're more likely to keep the players you've got and word of mouth and positive kind of feel around the club is likely to attract others, whether that's volunteers or players to your club. It also, and this is a key bit, we had the football foundation in today actually, and it is really important that it's making yourself investable. First thing that you'll get asked if you speak to funding partners and certainly moving forward for anything other than basic support from us as a county FA um, is if you come to us asking for support in a certain area, the first thing we're going to be asking you is, OK, can we have a little look at your uh, recent committee meeting minutes? Can we have a look at your annual accounts to see where you're at and, and what the financial situation is? And we also will be asking, can you send us a copy of your club constitution? Because we'll be wanting to check that the club is operating as it should be. And they're all good indicators that you are investable. So if the Football Foundation are looking to support you on a project, big or, uh, big or small, they know that the money coming to you is going to a club that's well governed, financially responsible and engages with its committee and members. So, so, so important for both of those two reasons. So anything tonight, you can see sharing is caring is in green. Anything in green tonight is going to be an opportunity or more a nudge for anyone that feels confident or wants to speak up to share. So some of it will be within the chat. And some of it will be by putting your hand up and we'll get you off mute and you can uh, input to the meeting. I'm, I've not seen anything in the chat and I'm worried it's not working because I can see loads of messages I'm getting from Microsoft Teams. Can somebody just type into the chat and hit enter just so I can double check the chat's working before we move on? Doesn't have to be anything. Mine's not working. Is it not working? Mine's not now. 
Oh, I've got one message. Hmm. Oh, they're all firing in. Um, OK, so the chat is working for some and not for others. If it's not working for you, it can't. It, sometimes if you are not logged in um, through the app of Teams, it can be a bit of a headache getting your messages in. Um, we had that issue last time. OK, you can stop firing the messages now. I've got it. I've message received. It's working for most. If you're struggling and you want to input, pop your hand up for me and we'll get you off mute. I can see there's a hand up. I just can't see whose it is. Oh, where is that hand? Uh, uh, Tony Moore. Certain has put his hand down now. OK, right. So sharing is caring. Anything in green is going to be an invitation for you guys to chip in and support each other. I want it to be about supporting each other. Um, and throughout this whole night tonight, I'm not going into massive, massive detail. I'm trying to spark you to have a little think about your processes, to share a few ideas, to check and challenge each other. And if you leave here tonight going, actually, we need to tweak that. That's a win for me. So I'm not we're not going to be here until eight o'clock, nine o'clock going through with a fine tooth comb. It's going to be about a few ideas, check and challenge and sharing some best best practice from you guys. And, and I said this to the team on Monday, I'm doing this meeting. I haven't hosted an AGM because I'm not a volunteer at a club at the minute, so I've not hosted an AGM. I don't spend my time doing club accounts all the time, although I have experience. It's not something I'm doing day to day like you are. So all the best information is going to come from you lot. So let's move it along. First and foremost, in the chat box, can you just describe quite briefly what an AGM is and why do clubs hold AGMs? Just fire away. I'll give you 30 seconds, a minute in there. Can just be a one word or if that's fine. We just want to get some ideas popping. Don't all rush that. So any ideas? What is an AGM? OK, so first bit chucked in. Uh, I think it's linked to why to vote in your club offices for the next 12 months. Good stuff. It's an annual general meeting. Election of club officials is stuff that's firing in. Brilliant from Jill talking about reviewing last year. So it's really important that we're looking to review the last 12 months and it'll be an interesting one this summer when you do yours to review and also to plan Jill's mentioned. Claire, very interesting around gaining the views of your shareholders or your members to discuss how you're going to proceed moving forward. Andy Abbott has mentioned the having accountability as a club, and that is absolutely really, really essential. Uh, feedback to members. Brilliant. Sally's mentioned about feeding back. Oh, wow. That's, I've, got, I've got to scroll up. Thank you, Dawn. I'm just going to have to scroll back up. Um, so feedback to the members on, on the review of the year, what's happened and plans moving forward. And that is so, so important because we talk about attracting volunteers and if people are looking from the outside in as your members who maybe aren't volunteers yet are looking at the club and thinking, wow, those plans sound exciting. That's the type of thing they might buy into and want to become part of. So it is really important that we're doing that. Also, that transparency is crucial for the good faith you get from your members. If they can see that you're operating correctly with the right governance behind the scenes, that is uh, the trust will be built. Um, and also they can see what work is going on and, and appreciate that. So it is really, really important. I'm just going to scroll back. Thank you to my colleague Rob mentions considering any other business. Um, Wendy's talked about the financial stuff, so agreeing on fees and stuff for following seasons. I like Jill's comment around allowing all to have a voice. I'm just going to scroll through Dawn's bit, highlighting the progress, electing the committee. Discuss and vote on changes to the constitution. Outstanding. Great knowledge in the group. Produce and review the accounts. Essential. Secretary is normally responsible for taking them. And it's a yearly meeting. Brilliant. So some really, really good stuff there. So great experience within the group. So what is an AGM? Uh, you've told me you already know it. The annual general meeting is once a year meeting generally held at the end of the season to review the season for the club. Why do we do it? We, we do it to comply with your constitution for those clubs that have it. So it will be constituted that you're going to hold an AGM. You do it to review your season tick. So you got that one. Communicate with your members, which is absolutely essential. Um, 
elections, which has been touched on. It's great transparency and it raises awareness of the work that the club is doing. So you've nailed step one. How do we go about these AGMs? So the pre-meeting stuff is really, really important. You will need to arrange a date. I've written here, invite all club members at least 21 days prior to the meeting um, and invite all members to nominate for elections. I've starred that because those second two points will be based on your constitution. If you've used our template, it will be 21 days prior to the meeting. Um, and there will be certain rules around how you go about nominating. So it is really important that you refer to your constitution, but it's crucial that you give your members the best chance and the most awareness so that they can attend. Um, that's best practice. You will hear horror stories when there's, it's maybe not a club that's running very well, where they spring an AGM so they can push through votes on issues that they want, for example, remain, remaining in post, but by making it a meeting that's small with a group of people that they know are going to be likely to side with them. So it's best practice to give your members all the opportunity in the world to attend these meetings, because as we've said in the chat, there's a real opportunity to reflect, to look at changes, to look at positive, move, positive moves going forward that we don't want to miss out on. Um, so it's so, so important that you give them the opportunity to do that. So your pre-meeting covered. What needs to be produced for an AGM? There must be an agenda and that will need to be sent out to people attending. There needs to be an annual or chairperson's report, which is your review of the season and the annual accounts or treasurer's report must be produced and they must be readily available for every person attending. So that is kind of your how we're going to go about it and what we're going to do first. The meeting itself, there's a few key areas that have to happen. Firstly, there must be some motions to be moved. Firstly, to accept the minutes of the last AGM. So like a committee meeting, you're reviewing last season's AGM um, and accepting the minutes of that. Also, it must the chairperson's report must be approved. So there must be a motion and it must be seconded that the chairperson's report is accurate and reflective of what's happened. Same with the treasurer's report. A motion must be tabled to approve that. And again, that is to state that it is accurate and a true reflection of the current situation. So uh, a motion moved and seconded. So really, really important. Those key things are taken care of because that is you clarifying exactly what has happened and they are the records. So it's really important those bits are covered. Right, just lost my notes. Let me just skip it on. Ah, on to nominations. So generally, a meeting, the AGM, will signal the end of your club's official, sorry, your club officials term in post. So the, the committee resign, generally. Um, all members of the club should be invited to nominate club or new club officials for the upcoming season. And I'll just reiterate, this will be in line with your club rules. So not everyone's exactly the same, but generally the committee step down and nominations are opened for new committee members or the same ones. And again, it's normally a nomination that is seconded by someone else. Um, some organisations will request that nominations come in in written prior to a meeting. So if that's how your constitution is set up, adhere to that but in most cases the nominations are nominated and seconded within the meeting so it's best practice that your committee members step down um, and then have the opportunity to either vote them back in or to uh, vote new people and this is where it goes back to the, the importance of allowing people to attend uh, and not keeping it a closed shop so okay, it's a case of it's a case of anyone, uh, sorry, the only people there are the same committee and they almost go in, we resign and we vote ourselves back in. So it would be best practice um, to, to allow members to attend. Um, so that helps support the nomination process. I'm just going to skip on. Roger, I, oh, Roger or Robert, I can't see which way around your name is. I'll come back to that in a second. And it's staying on how the meeting the post meeting and during the meeting. The minutes have to be recorded. They need to be a true and accurate reflection. We do have a template that sits on our website. I've seen some good examples come in. Thank you to those people that sent me your examples in of how you're recording your AGM. Um, but it all needs to be recorded. And again, be transparent, send the minutes out to your club members um, so they can see what's happened, who's been voted in, what the plans are, what the financial situation is at the club. 
and so on for that transparency. And if we do have any handovers, so a secretary has stepped down and a new secretary has been voted in, there needs to be some form of handover and that transition um, of handed over to them so they're fully briefed on exactly what they need to do. There might be a window where you need to get them qualified, et cetera, et cetera. So your AGM has to be recorded uh, and any handovers need to be dealt with in a, a recorded time frame. Right, we'll just go back. So that's AGMs in a nutshell. Like I said, I'm not expecting to be teaching you anything new. Um, is there any kind of thoughts on, on what we've covered there? Has anyone had any ideas? I thought, actually, we've not been doing that or could we change what we're doing here or do we need to look at this? If there's anything like that, Matt, do you want to unmute yourself, please? Yeah, I just, I just wondered whether yourself or anybody else has got a clinical definition for youth and senior teams of what a member should be. You, you, that's a great question. Um, it will be defined by your constitution. Let me just pull up a template of a constitution. Sorry, I'm just going to have to drag myself out. Where are you? Club development. One second. Let me just get this on my other page so I can get you back up. That's a great question. So, in our template constitution, the members of the club from time to time shall be those persons listed in the register of members, the membership register, which shall be maintained by the club secretary. Any person who wishes to be a member must apply on the membership application form and deliver it to the club. Election to membership shall be at the discretion of the club committee and granted in accordance with anti-discrimination and equality policies which are in place. An appeal against a refusal, we don't need to cover in that. Um, membership shall become effective upon an applicant's name being entered in the membership register. So how you go about that is, is kind of club to club and it will be different from club to club. But essentially, there needs to be some process for someone to become a member. Generally, when you sign up to a club and you become a paying customer, if you will, that is normally your membership kind of registration, if that makes sense. So it will differ club to club. Um, I know with adult clubs in particular, you might have members who are absolutely not playing or coaching and they are just members of the club. Um, so that is the definition by our club constitution. Does that clear anything up for you or do you want me to go deeper into that and get you some extra information? No, no, I, th I, th I think that's largely in line with what I thought. It's just that we've got some complicating factors with, you know, whereby you know, some grandparents are the people that actually pay, but their parents are the one that bring in into the match and such like. And, it, it, and clearly we've got to register, but it's it's how we treat that register, if you see what I mean, you know. OK, that yeah, that is a little bit of a maybe a grey area. I don't know. I'm thinking with a common sense approach, although you know the grandparents paying, if the parent is the one that signed the child up and, and signed their registration, I'd probably look at it as their, the parent being the member. But again, if you flip it, they're pay, the grandparent is paying into the club. They probably do earn, earn some rights to become a member there. So that is probably something you as a club might need to visit at your AGM uh, or in a special meeting to, to talk about how you're going to define that and, and make sure it's not grey moving yeah, forward. Definitely. But it will differ club to club. But that is actually that's quite an interesting point that this is why we have these meetings. I would have never considered that. Um, uh, I can't Roger or Robert. I can't tell because there's a comma. I can't tell if your name's Roger or Robert, but uh, many junior coach junior clubs only by coaches and managers of the club AGM. Is that correct? It's club members. So it, it goes back onto what we have just said there. So any member of the club should be invited and um, how you define members at your club. Um, will will dictate who is invited. Oh, interesting. So Andy's mentioned that they uh, they ask which member of the family they wish, uh, which person in the family they wish to name as the kind of designated member. So that's an interesting approach. Andy, is that written into your constitution? Yeah, perfect. So that's written into the constitution. That's nice, nice and clear. OK, right. So interesting. Right, we'll move on if there's no more bits on AGMs. Let me move on. Let's get a 
bit of feedback. There we go. Right, on to the next one. So we're back onto the green stuff. Club constitutions, first and foremost. Have you read your club's constitution? A yes or a no in the chat box. And I want to say read it. I mean, you've read it from top to bottom. You've not had a quick glance. So have you read your club's constitution? And then if you're feeling confident, stick your hand up for me. If you in kind of the last 12, 24 months have had to refer to your constitution to resolve uh, a club matter. So if anyone's got any examples of when they've had to refer to their club constitution um, for a club matter. So stick your hand up if you've got an example for me. <laughs> so good stuff actually, everyone's flying in. You've read. God, I need someone to be confident for me, otherwise you're going to get my same boring example that I say to every club when I speak to them. So last chance, any hands up? Has anyone got an example of when they've had to refer to the constitution to solve a club matter? And it can be a really little one, really simple one. Last chance before you get mine. Maybe mine will inspire you. So a common one we get, um, it's going to, it's going nuclear a bit, but common one we get is, okay, here we go. Andy, do you, Andy are you willing to unmute yourself uh, and talk about that one? Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had um, an issue with a coach that wasn't behaving correctly, uh, wasn't really adhering to the constitution of fair play, um, bullying, etc. So we, we actually go through that motion with a welfare officer and you know read the constitution to them that they'd signed up to um, as a coach and um, you know take the necessary action that we needed to do. And so we had to do it all um, correctly via, you know, the, the written law that we'd put down as the, the club rules. Awesome. Did your constitution kind of outline exactly what the process was and, and was it quite straightforward to follow and, and go through with that process? It was quite straightforward to follow in, in the respect that it stated what was expected of the coach. Okay. We are actually going to make some amendments to it to make it actually a clearer disciplinary process okay. if that's broken. Okay. Excellent. So there's, that's a great example. That's similar to the one I was going to bring bring up. Um, a, a member of the club, so a coach in that situation, is not adhering or not um, uh, sticking to the club rules. Um, so examples we get of that, um, a coach is refusing to do a new DBS, so they're non-compliant, they're refusing to do it. Tom, what do we do? And I will always refer, OK, what does your club constitution say? Well, it says we can, ex we can expel members for X, Y and Z, and this is the process. You've answered the question. You have to adhere to club constitution and work through that process um, to, to remove that person if that's what you deem fit. And that your constitution will explain how you do that. Um, so that's a great example of where your constitution is working effectively. It outlines what a member has to adhere to. It outlines the process of what may happen if you don't. And it highlights exactly how you go through that process. So that is a great example of your constitution being a working document. Uh, in black and white and supporting the club to make decisions and what it does is it removes any personal feelings and thoughts or what are out of that situation rather than you go oh this guy's an idiot he won't listen to us let's get your constitution removes all that personal stuff away from it so you can just point to the constitution and say these are the club rules and uh, you've not adhered to them we've given you ample opportunity please see x email y email uh, the email from yesterday asking you to do that we've had no response We've begun a disciplinary process and you've been expelled from the club. We actually had an example of a chairman being voted out not three weeks ago and it was totally justified and it was totally done by the book and the constitution when the person came back to me to say, well, what's going on? I said, Hold on a minute. You've been voted out. I can see a record of it. I can see it fits in line with the club constitution. Unfortunately, that's the decision the club have taken. So it's a good example there. Um, We've got a few more people mentioning a round uh, discipline of coach. Luke, would you mind unmuting yourself if you if you're feeling like you want to just explain a little bit more about releasing a player? Similar to what Andy said, really about the coach. Um, obviously, parents and players read the constitution and sign up and agree to adhere to those what's set out in it. And we we had, unfortunately had a a young um, a young lad that on numerous occasions, shall we say, just breached that. Using foul and abusive language, and 
it was on more than one occasion. So we followed the process and, and you know, it's never a nice thing to have to release a player, but um, it was set out in the constitution and they did sign to that agreement when they signed up to the club. So uh, it was all done uh, in an official manner. Okay, that's, that's perfect. That's a, another example of, of constitution being a working document and supporting the club to to maintain its values and its, and its rule. Um, so it's a real essential document. So constitution, the question you've always got to be asking yourself as a club, is it fit for purpose? So we've said it is a live document, a working document. Your constitution sentimental club. So going back to, to what Luke just said there, that player was not in line with the club's values and beliefs. So that's a problem. It's clearly outlined what the club's ethos is within your constitution or a good constitution. It'll explain to your members what the club's about. It helps to protect club members and in particular your club officers, which is your committee. Clarify the procedures, which we've just covered. Clarify and help sort out internal problems. That is for me top of the list. Is your constitution fit for purpose? Is it allowing you, is it black and white to help you sort out common internal problems? Things such as discipline of players, things such as uh, the coach situation that's brought up, things such as people not paying their subscriptions, things such as maybe it's a committee member not meeting the requirements of their role. Does it help you sort those matters out? And they're all worst case scenarios, but that's what it's, it's that safety net that's there for you. Know, like I said, it takes the personal element out of it when the club rules are crystal clear and shared with members. Other things that it's really important for the club constitution, it outlines the size and shape of your committee, how often they need to meet, and it outlines things such as holding, hosting your AGM, any special meetings uh, and dissolution of the club should it come to that. But we're not going to cover that because we're not talking about dissolving clubs in this meeting. Um, and last thing, it'll underpin any funding application. So I'm bringing it back to funding and development. First thing any funding body will ask, we need to see constitution. They won't even consider an application from a group that aren't constituted because it's not a sound investment. They've got to see that the club is running and functioning as it should do. And the last bit, which was covered right at the start, um, sorry, it was covered in the AGMs. At your AGM, that is the time to propose rule changes. So um, we've just mentioned there, I think it was Andy talking about they're going to tidy up some of the rules around that issue with the discipline of a coach. AGM's the, the time to do that, or a special general meeting could be called to make changes. But constitutions can't just be changed willy nilly. Those changes have to be voted in. Uh, and they need to be done via the correct process. Um, so on that, there's a green bit at the bottom, hands up again. Has anyone got any, other than Andy's, anyone got an example of your club implementing a rule change whilst you've been there? So not just last year, over the, over the last five, ten years. Does anyone have an example of implementing a rule change at their club? So you can fire it in the chat or you can put your hand up um, uh, and get yourself unmuted. So last chance to pop one in. OK, I'll give you an example of one we're working on at the minute, and it's linked to the Euros legacy that we'll be coming on to for a couple of minutes towards the end of this meeting. We're really working hard uh, to push the female game in the county, and we're going to be challenging clubs that have female provision to really look inwards at how they're going to make their clubs more inclusive. So we are working with clubs to, to build within to their constitution, working towards uh, target percentage of female volunteers so that might be percentage of the committee being female volunteers or within the coaching workforce and i just want to get my disclaimer now that is not saying that you need to get rid of male volunteers what we're at what we're trying to um, work towards is increasing the number of female volunteers so we're going to be supporting clubs to build those top that target into their constitution so not to say if we haven't got 50 percent, we're in breach of our constitution, therefore in trouble. It's going to be about wording those that the club will endeavour and work towards achieving a 30 percent um, 
a minimum of 30% female volunteers within the committee, for example. So that's one rule change that we'll be working uh, and supporting clubs to, to try and deliver as part of our Euros pledge. So that will have to be um, tabled at the AGM, voted for by the members, and if it's pushed through, then it will sit within your constitution. So that is an example of a rule change that might be implemented. Um, so a couple on it. So we've had Robert has mentioned they his club they've added in a non-return of your club subs if you leave the club. So interesting. And again, I'll assume you went through the full processes, but it's in black and white. It's clear to those members at the start of the season. So excellent. Uh, added a separate code of conduct document which sits under the constitution. Brilliant. And again, I assume that those behaviours within the code of conduct were voted in by the committee or by the members at, at the AGM to, to build that in. So superb, some great examples there. Right, so we'll shift on. Annual accounts. So in the chat box again, how do you currently do your accounts? And by that, I mean, are you using a particular program? Is it in a little black book? How do you currently do your accounts? And again, if anyone's feeling brave, you want to stick your hands up to talk about what you currently include or you can chuck it in the chat. What things do we need to include within our club accounts? Or annual accounts, sorry. So yes, Excel first and foremost. No shock to see a bit of Excel. Any advance on Excel? Right, so we've got a few clubs where, OK, so Robert's mentioned that their treasurer is a chartered accountant. Outstanding. That's you've definitely cashed in there. Zero, which is very much on the up. I think we might be moving towards that in, in the near future. Linda said not a penny is wrong when Steve does it at, at, at their club. He's a chartered accountant too. Excellent. So some of you are very blessed and that's definitely some good recruiting. Um, we've got Microsoft Word. So interesting, a few different approaches coming in. Just if anyone wants to unmute or if you want to find some more stuff in the chat around what what do you currently include within those accounts? Uh, what needs to be in your annual accounts? I'm going to shift it on while it's, while it's quiet. So first thing we want you to think about is does your current method work? Um, so by that, is it functional and is it easily shared? So we really want to move away, and I'm not saying anyone in this group's doing it, but we really want to move away from the kind of pen and paper or really, really basic forms of just listing in and out, in and out, all the way down, um, style of accounting. Because it makes it very difficult to really keep track of what's going on. It also makes it very difficult if it's handed over um, to someone new or someone steps away. So we really want it to to be a, a we want it to be really simple, which brings me on to simplicity and accuracy format for your accounts. So it's really essential that they're accurate and up to date. It's easy to understand. Um, and if you treasure a left tomorrow, someone could pick them up and carry them on quite simply. So accuracy and simplicity is absolutely essential. All profit and loss, so all money that comes in and out. For me, it can't just be, like I said, a list of each bit of money that comes in and out. How we kind of log in that. So is it being categorised? Is it being done per team and filtering into a main set of accounts? Is your club the size where you can just have one kind of set of books or is it split across the teams that filter in? Do teams do their own accounts and then it's fed upwards? So there's a lots of variety um, of methods that clubs are using, but it's really, really important that as a bare minimum, it's electronic so it can be shared. All profit and loss or money in and out is recorded and that it's categorised so you can see easily where money's being spent, where money isn't being spent, what are your main expenditures, what are your main incomes, 
and when across the season that is. And after two or three seasons of running those accounts effectively, you can start to build up a really clear picture of your times where you're going to be spending a lot of money or money out. So it might be pitch fees, new kit, training venues, etc. And it can help you become a little bit more sustainable because you can plan ahead and you can set dates to get the money in, for example, on membership fees to prevent any issues kind of down the line. So it's absolutely essential. There's a bare minimum. They're electronic. They're accurate and simple. And it covers all money coming in and out. We've had a few people kind of pop some stuff in. So I'd be interested to hear how your club goes about it specifically, if anyone is willing to, to speak up. Like I said, we do have methods where teams are responsible and it feeds up. We do have clubs where it's totally managed centrally. There's quite a few different models. So is anyone willing to kind of pop the hand up and just talk about how they go about it at their club and, and the pros and cons around that? Uh, whose hand is that? Uh, Linda, do you want to speak? I do. Um, unfortunately, we are out. We are the old school that you talk about. Ours is all okay. done on, on paper. Like I said, Steve Poole has done it all on paper, but it is all categorised. Every income, every outgoing, it's categorised into maintenance. It's ca categorised into spending for footballs, for kit, for um food for so everything is categorized and itemized um we also have um an audit from every team every month that steve then goes through and that's all checked against the bank and then it's all audited by a chartered accountant um so unfortunately we are all old school <laughs> but i would like anybody at the minute to to be able to say you know he's not doing a good job on it but you know we do have to move to future sorry steve i know you're listening um but it is it is it just <laughs> counts. it's really really well done um and no, i'm, I'm not, not an accountant so i'm not going to check or challenge that you no know, all money from every team from our club goes into one main account so nobody's able to draw anything else out it, it all comes from a couple of people that's all that money can be drawn out it's just our safeguarding to make sure that money doesn't disappear. No, and that, and that, that sounds to me, although we've talked about electronic, that sounds a perfect model. I don't know if Steve wants to, I know you said he's listening, if he wants to unmute himself and add anything to that, he's an expert and I'm not. Um, I, I'm always looking at it from the basic, from the absolute base of where I want clubs to be as a bare minimum. And that's yeah. a great example of, of a really effective committee um, managing the finances of the club in a really clear uh, and accurate manner. So all the stuff I've said, apart from electronic, is being ticked and more than. So that's a really, really interesting way. And Linda, how many teams do you have at the club? Uh, let me think. We're just growing. Um, how many have we got, Steve? Um, <laughs> one, uh, a men's team. We're just having a new Saturday team. So that's two. A ladies team, three. Two girls teams, that's five. A boys team, that's six now. And the, and the central kind of bank account, is that that's working well for you as a club? We only have one bank account. They pay their money in, um, they sign it over to Steve and then it gets paid into the bank account. And then if anybody wants to draw any money out, it's, um, Steve can't draw it out because he, he's not on the list. I can, he can pay it in, but he can't draw it out. So then we have two or three other signatories that can go and draw that money out and then it's handed back and signed for. So nobody has, we don't have a, a card. For, I know it's old school, but we don't have a card. So nobody can take any money out of that bank. I mean, we know a lot of teams locally that's lost a lot of money, you know, well, back. Really, really good safe guard in this, it? Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. brilliant. Is anyone, is anyone doing it any different to that? So I'm interested in kind of the model maybe around multiple accounts or if you're doing it electronically i know someone mentioned they're using zero i'd be really interested to hear how that how that works for you as a club if anyone else wants to drop in yeah they all have their own accounts tom so they can all have yeah. like we don't we don't keep it centrally as a pot for us they all uh it's all steve shows it all individually for each age team and they know exactly what they've got in there in the in the account and they can draw out whenever they want. So we don't take anything as a club other than fees for the pictures. That's it. Awesome. OK. Last chance on accounts there. I know that was a very brief stop on that. 
Anyone doing it any different way? Okay, we're gonna, oh, sorry, there is a question. Let me just bump it back. Um, is there any plan to add club accounts to be available as part of match day? That'd be a question for the FA. I think down the line, and this was something I approached um, Danielle, who <coughs> left the FA, um, around are the FA going to work towards uh, almost an approved account through a PayPal, for example, that's linked to match day? Almost a grassroots football club account that can be managed in a way that suits your club. It's not something that's going to happen in the near future. Um, I would like the Match Day app to get that far. I know a few examples of clubs that, are off the back of using Match Day, have started to work off PayPal accounts. That's generally kind of one team adult clubs um, or smaller clubs. Um, but in the near future, there's not going to be a preferred account that the FA are going to recommend or give you access to it's just not there yet I, I think it's certainly something that has been discussed but there's a lot of layers to that um that make it quite a challenge and that would obviously be at, at, at a national level and not at a county level okay moving on again consistent committee meetings this one will be quick in the chat how often does your committee meet and meet and do you share the minutes with your members So first answer in once a month under normal circumstances. Awesome. So a few different different uh, ways. We've got some that are monthly, some that are quarterly, um, three a year from one club. Uh, most people saying that they do share the minutes. So brilliant. So minutes, it's so important that they are shared. Um, like we said, we really want to shout about the hard work that you guys are putting in um, and show the members the work that goes on behind the scenes. It's particularly for those adult clubs. It is not just turning up on a Saturday to play and the club runs itself. It's really important that we showcase the work that you are sorry that you are doing behind the scenes to allow these people to play, to make it more appreciated, also to inspire them and think I might want to be part of that. If they're unhappy with how the club's running, that might be a kick up the backside to think, actually, I'm going to I'm going to put myself forward to be on the committee uh, and support the club in that manner. So it, it's essential that we share them. In terms of reg, uh, how regular you meet, again, we'll point back to your constitution. What does your constitution outline and how often should you meet? For you larger clubs in particular, the monthly meetings are really beneficial, but it can be time consuming, it can be tricky to get everyone there that needs to be there. Um, so generally, the smaller the club, I find that the, the less frequently you meet um, and there might be times where you have to meet more frequently and then you might have more quiet times um, throughout the year. But that will be constituted. So if you are constituted to hold X amount of meetings, you need to be doing that uh, as a club. If you think there's too many, then vote rule change in and get that bit changed. Um, so committee meetings, why do we do them? Well, we need them because it's all about organising the day-to-day -day running a club. It's the kind of behind the scenes bit that, that keeps everything ticking over. So what we have to include, the agenda, within the agenda, sorry, signing off last meeting minutes, a finance report, safeguarding and qualifications update, any other business and all areas of club development. Key bits to me are your safeguarding and qualification report. It can be a really good time to review that and get in front of any qualifications that might be coming towards expiration. The finance report doesn't have to be the same as the in-depth treasure, treasurer report from an AGM, but it's just to touch base and check on the finances um, regularly. Um, but the areas of club development uh, is the most important part for me. That's the day-to-day -day running. So it might be areas of fundraising. It might be grounds work that's taking part. It might be a, a purchasing new kit. It might be painting the clubhouse, whatever that is. As a committee, it's being organised. You're having an agenda point on it. It's recorded who's raised it and who's responsible in the time frame. And that allows the club to really, really structure what you're doing over the next month, if you're a monthly, over the next three months. And it's crystal clear who's doing it, when it's being done and who's responsible. And that allows you as a club to really monitor 
what's going on and ensuring that everything that needs to be done is done. So I will really encourage you because this is one area that I keep hitting uh, a brick wall with with a lot of clubs when they're coming to me for support is how often are you meeting? Oh, we've, we've actually never had a committee meeting. Right. How do you manage a club day to day? And there's no answer. So I'm not saying that's you guys in this meeting because you're here because you're, you're looking to improve or develop or work with us. But having those meetings is so, so key to the kind of just the smooth sailing, if you will, of your club. So we really encourage you to, even in these times, to find ways to meet regularly. So it might be on Teams, it might be on Zoom. As things open up, it might be at the clubhouse. Um, but to meet regularly, to check and challenge each other, and to really plot and plan what's coming up over the next few months. So there's no shocks or surprises and everything that needs to be done is getting done. Um, so that's just a real brief one on, on committee meetings because they're so, so essential. So that kind of covers this closed season roundup, if you will, um, of, of kind of best practice, what we want you to be looking out for uh, and things that we want to be happening for the minute this season wraps up. That's the stuff we want to see. So yeah, AGM's taking place. We want to see you go through that, that process with your committees in particular of elections, of any rule changes that need to take place and reviewing your year and plotting ahead for the next 12 months. Absolutely crucial to what hopefully next year is going to be a little bit smoother than the stop start of this year. Your constitutions, a lot of those constitutions or the ones that come in were written a long time ago and have, have kind of remained the same. So they might no longer be fit for purpose. So we really want you to check and challenge, review your constitution as a committee. If you feel the need to make changes, your AGM or an SGM is going to be your time to do that um, and do that correctly by the book. Your annual accounts, for those of you that have got processes in place that are really strong, continue to do that. Um, and for those of you that maybe looked at that, actually there's, there's areas we need to improve or we need to, we need to adapt the way we're doing it or include different things within that. This is your time as a kind of fresh season starting to get off on the front foot uh, and ensure moving forward that your finances are recorded in a really sharp way um, that protect the club. Really interesting comments from Linda around the safeguarding of the finances to ensure that there's no issues. So this could be an opportunity again in the AGM window to look at how you are doing your annual accounts um, and maybe adapt or change the way you do that in the future. And kicking off again on the front foot on getting your committee meetings back being consistent, even if it needs to be online to ensure you've got that smooth day to day running a club. So, like I said, that wasn't an in-depth insight. I am more than happy from anyone on this meeting. If you are thinking, actually, we want to have a look at that in more depth. I'm happy to do that with you off the meeting and at a separate time um, and happy to work with you to make changes or to make improvements or to review your current processes. Um, for those of you that are doing things really well, I'd still encourage you to reflect uh, and, ch and check and challenge yourselves again in this kind of close season window. Um, but hopefully that wasn't too heavy. It was maybe a little nudge to have a little look at and maybe adapt some things and maybe you've heard some examples of some best practice. Um, so we'll move on because I'm conscious of the time. So last couple of bits from me before we open it back up to, to you. Euro 22. 2022 club legacy projects. So I briefly touched on this a moment ago. We're really lucky in the county. We've got two host stadiums for the tournament next year. Hopefully you saw yesterday we were at the year year launch. So a year to go to the tournament. So there's loads of marketing um, in Sheffield and Rotherham where the tournament's going to be hosted across loads of different platforms, not just ours, from a lot of sporting bodies, uh, from the local paper, local radio and so on around this tournament. And we are looking to really, really use this tournament as a platform to kick on again. So you may have seen in the last strategy for female game, the FA's aim was to double participation. They smashed through that. And we're going again. So we're looking to continue the growth in participation um, and everything that comes along with that. So growing clubs, um, supporting a network of volunteers and to just keep growing the game. So you're going to see lots from us moving forward over the next year. And whilst the tournament's on of, of either projects or development ideas or just general advertising of the tournament all surrounded and geared up towards that. Um, so one project I just want to uh, kind of bring to your attention is the Euros Club project. 
that we're putting together. The aim of the project is to have more representative club committees to increase the number of female volunteers in the game and support the clubs because you, you're, you're the people out there delivering it. Um, support the clubs to be the best places for women and girls to play football now and in the future. And the future part is why we're working so hard with the committees and the number of volunteers because what we want is role models and sustainability moving forward so we don't want it to be a flash in the pan next year when there's a buzz around the tournament and then it tapers off we want this to be a lasting legacy so all of our work will be legacy projects to try and maximize the impact of the tournament so we'll be sending some communication out about that over the next couple of weeks so if you're a club with female provision you'll be hearing from us around that particular cl club project and any other projects that we've got coming up. And last bit from me, uh, you may have seen the poster that, that won uh, our competition a few months ago, um, but Leon's asked me to bring to your attention a little piece around mental health awareness. Leon and Claire have been working really, really hard with a number of bodies around mental health, particularly around anxiety and stress in this time, um, and people that are, are involved in football. So there's a little link on this slide, and I'll send this slide out, like I said, uh, tomorrow morning we'd be really pleased if you could click on that link um, and provide some feedback on that um, because it helps us kind of direct where we're going to be going with future projects but like i said leon and claire are actually on with samaritans tonight so it's a case of watch this space we're going to keep pushing and working in that area um, to support the football community um, and if you're you're doing any work within your clubs or within your local area that you want us to shout about or you want to inform us of so we can get behind and support please 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 do get in touch it's a really important area for us um, so please let us know if you are doing any work or you require any support in those areas and we'll be happy to link you in um, with our partners so that is the end of me talking it's time for any questions I'm happy to answer any questions on affiliation if you've got any questions around the pre-season stuff that we've covered on and I'll assume there will at least be one question on the dreaded COVID. So I'm going to go to uh, Matt Malarkey, if you want to unmute yourself first. Yeah, it's, it's not something that's been talked about this evening, but just want to confirm the situation with annual health checks, because it's currently shown on the whole game system that ours is due in 10 days time and it's not even open for us. Right, don't worry about annual health checks. So the annual health check window, no, because um, F chart standard, as you should have been contacted, is now shifting onto the accreditation format through England football. The, the health check wasn't um, open last year, so it just was ignored. It was put on hold um, and we're shifting over to the new criteria. There will be and it will be in one of two formats. And I don't want to give you the, I don't want to say it's one and then it's the other. There will be some form of health check next season. So the window used to open in September and it used to shut at the start of April. So there will either be that model or it's going to be a live model where the system will check your qualifications live and it will tell you what you need to do and it will give you a set frame. John Smith's DBS has expired. You've got X amount of time to do it or your chart standard will lapse. I'm just Matt, just remind me of exactly what club you're on and I will just double check that that's all coaching for you on your system. Right, yeah. OK, I'll check that for you. So health checks. Yep. Yeah, so there's not going to be uh, there's nothing to worry about at the minute. It's all affiliation currently and we'll come on to health checks into next season. But I'm not 100 percent sure whether it's going to be live or if it's going to be uh, a set deadline. But it certainly it is working towards being a live process. So if you've seen the player reg part of whole game now, that's on the new platform. And when everything moves to that, that's when we get the added bonus of all of these things working effectively. Um, I'm just going to double check that your status didn't get uh, done wrong. Where are you? OK, I'm just going to jump on some other questions as well. That loads. Two, three. Uh, can we put live on your constitution? Linda, I'm not sure what that means. Can we put live on your constitution, please? Let's check that chart standard status while we're on. Yeah, Matt, your chart standard status is all it's all good. 
he says your next renewal is the end of May next year. So that'll get fixed whenever um, we do flick on to the new uh, accreditation. Thank you. I know, Jill, if you're still on, I've read your question from earlier. Qualifications. You may have seen now that Safeguard and the First Aid have now moved on to online versions of the course. So we can now stop encouraging coaches to go on to interim courses. Emergency First Aid or the IFAFE, Introduction to First Aid in Football, sorry, is, is the real name. And Safeguarding Children course on, are up and running. So if you go onto the boot room and you go onto learning and you hit Safeguarding or First Aid, it will take you there. Those courses are online. So they are the full courses. They do require payment, but we can start to direct our coaches towards them. And that will help, interestingly, on Matt's comment. For those of you with quite a few that have done interim measures, when we do come around to a health check process, whether it's live or fixed date, let's try and get in front of this so we're not chasing those coaches that have got interim qualifications. So they're up and running. If you go to the boot room, FA boot room, um, and go on to learning, you can get straight onto those courses. So start directing your um, start directing your coaches or your volunteers to there, um, and they can take care of it themselves. And the beauty of it is they're not having to pick a date. They can do they can just crack on um, in the most part um, and get it done. I think the first aid one is still delivered by a tutor, but there's a lot more available dates because they're not having to travel um, and so on. So I will just put a link in for us there. Uh, will that course update? Yes, yeah, so if, if they do the interstate in football, that is the proper qualification and that will show up on your qualification report. So for those of you that have noticed, the interim ones wouldn't show um, because they're moving on to the new platform. They couldn't build in. They couldn't build in the format um, for it to recognise it. So the proper qualifications that I'm just putting into the chat now, they will tick off on people's qualification reports. For those of you um, wanting information around the level one, that course will go live at the start of August or the end of July. It's going to be called the Introduction to Coaching Football. It is a paid course. Um, so it will replace the level one. It is a paid course, but again, it's totally online. There's no face to face delivery, so it's a lot more accessible. Um, and therefore, again, hopefully gives an opportunity to really push our coaches towards that. They can't dip in and out, so it's not um, kind of robot workshops. Again, that is face, face to face, the wrong word. It is delivered by, by a set of tutors, so they have to log in at set times on set nights, but a lot more accessible. So those courses are all in the chat with the links. Um, we usually pay for our coaches. Can we do this for them? They're going to have to put, they're going to have to log in with their fan and password and do it that way. So the ways around it would be if you have a club account. You allow them access to, to do that or it might be that they pay themselves and you as a club reimburse them. Um, other than that, it may be worth if you've got a mass of coaches. I'm sure that um, Louise has mentioned this. If you have a mass of coaches, so let's say you've got 16 all at the same time, I think if you contact education at the FA.com, um, I think they have a way of doing a mass payment and, and granting those people access to a course. Don't hold me to that, but I've certainly heard that spoken about on a previous meeting. Um, so if there is a situation where you want to do, I know some of you as clubs, um, did in-house courses that's not going to be we're not going to be able to do that because it's not county led anymore it's FA led but it'll be worth contacting education at the FA uh, and asking the question if you can make a mass payment for a, a select amount of courses and if you've got their names and fans I'm fairly certain they'll be able to allocate straight to that for coaches still wanting to do their level one will the online safeguard and the first aid courses now count towards this so as part of your payment for introduction to football that will include the safeguarding of first aid as it did previously. If they've already done it, I can't confirm if there'll be a discount. I don't think there will. But within that level one course, when they complete the introduction to level one, they will be level one introduction to football. So they'll be level one first aid and safeguard safeguarded. So I'll have the trivector um, of everything that you need there um, for your health check for chart standard. Um, the coach is still there. Will the online safe got a first aid course available now? Yeah, so like uh, like I was saying there, Will, Willow, sorry. If 
they've already done it. It will can't, They won't have to do it again. Um, so if they've already done not the interim measure, but they've done the safeguarding children course, or they've done introduction to first aid in football, that will count towards it. If they've done the two interim measures, it won't, and they will have to do the proper ones. Um, and like I said, the the cost is built into the introduction to football. Um, any level one courses coming up, Linda? Those courses will be going live. Um, July, August, and as I've said, we no longer have the administration of the courses. It is now national. It is all done through the boot room, and courses will sign up for the uh, coaches will sign up for the course through there on the dates and courses they can do, and they'll be going live from kind of July, August. I've been assured by the FA that we will not have problems with people not being able to access course. So they're not all going to get full on day one and then we can't get our coaches on. We've been assured that built into the program, um, so built into the schedule, that it's going to be heavy at the start and then taper off. So I'm very confident that they are going, they are going to be able to um, meet the needs. Um, someone said, I thought it was live in June. It might be June, it might be July. It might. Let me get the date for you. I sit in so many meetings at the minute. When are you going live? When are you going live? I'm going to, I'm going to stick my neck out. And I'm going to say it's July. Um, da, 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 da. Who needs that first day? There's never a... So should they wait for the level one? Uh, Willow, depending on... I would for the... It's just easier as a package to pay the cost um, as one. Um, and it will be value for money rather than doing the 20 quid for the safeguard and the 30 quid or 25 pounds for the first aid and then paying for the level one with that cost built in. So I'd recommend they do that as one um, and do it that way if from a financial point of view. Um, in terms of discount coaches need the first aid and safeguarding. I, yeah, Claire, I don't think that will be built in. It never has been before and I, I don't think it will be, unfortunately. And I think the point will be from the FA will be um, well, it's always good to renew it. So even if you only did it last year, their point of view would be, we'll do it again. Uh, and then you've got another three years and the safeguarding will only be two years now, but it is all online rather than a face to face and then a top up online. Um, Claire, in terms of free courses, I won't, I won't stick my neck out yet. Previously, we had the level one bursary that was Sport England money to get qualified uh, youth teams with qualified coaches. I've heard nothing of that yet. I would be amazed over the next three years if we don't see some sort of support financially to um, really push getting qualified coaches um, for youth teams. But at the minute, there's nothing that's been brought to my attention on that. So I think for this season, um, I don't see there being any bursaries for level ones, unfortunately. Uh, Jill, you, I, I'll take your word for it. Like I said, I've sat in so many meetings on this now, all the dates and the first aid and safeguard and level one, they're all starting to merge into one for me. I know a num there has been some pilot courses and there will be pilot courses. So some of those coaches may have been on that, but um, I'll take your word for it because I've lost track of exactly which courses start on which day. Um, but yeah, in terms of accessibility for your coaches, there's never, ever going to be a better time than over the next six months. It's really shifted in their favour of accessibility, working from home uh, and getting qualified in a in a situation at a price that's beneficial for everyone. So on that front, it's really, really positive. Um, have I missed any questions that weren't on courses? And again, if you want to stick your hand up, if you've got anything else that you want to raise or ask um, and just while they do come in so this was the first meeting we've had that's been a little bit more uh, looking inwards development focused this is the plan moving forward so there is a schedule of events that we've got kind of planned um, one around funding and fit for funding um, we also are going to look to do a piece on facilities and I don't want that to scare people away and think that's, that doesn't apply to us because what we want to do is put on a workshop that fits everyone. Um, so some really exciting stuff around facilities and improving grass pitches in particular. So if you play on a council pitch, that workshop will still be relevant to you. So there is a programme of work moving forward that we're going to try and, uh, and get out there. 
If there are areas that you as clubs want support in, please get in touch with me and we'll be happy to make that work. So we have been contacted previously around legal structures. And if there is interest, I can contact Sport England and Club Matters and get them to get a, an expert on, on legal structures to deliver to a set number of you. So there's scope to do it. We can get expert deliveries in. So it's not just me with a, a light brush. We can get people to come in and really look into details of set areas if there's appetite. So please feel free to chuck it in the chat now, reply to me by email. If there's areas you want us to support you in, if there's things you want us to do differently, please, please let us know because this, this meeting and all the club development stuff we do is, is for you. So we want to make it the best for you. So please do um, send us an email, chuck it in the chat, whatever you want, so we can help to support you. Matt, your hands up again, do you want to come off mute? Yeah, sorry, me again. Um, you mentioned at the start about uh, welfare officers needing four bits of qualification. And yeah. I just want to check that. So obviously DBS, welfare officer workshop and safeguarding committee members. Do they really need safeguarding as well? Yeah, unfortunately, they have to do the safeguarding children course, online safeguarding for committee members and the welfare officer workshop. The rationale for that is... The welfare course is geared towards dealing with reports um, and managing that process. The safeguarding children course is around risk and safeguarding of children. So recognising the four types. Oh, no, my memory's gone. Four or five types of abuse. That shows how long ago it is since I did it. Recognising abuse and understanding what to do in those what's poor practice, what's abuse and the process and the online safeguarding for committee members is a real light brush around what the committee's role is to ensure that safeguard is implemented throughout a club. So although it's a pain, that's the rationale behind that. Again, that's not a decision at Sheffield, that's a decision at, at FA level, but that's the they're the kind of three that come together um, to make a welfare officer, if you will. And the welfare officer course is online also now. It is delivered by tutor. Um, so you have to pick a time and a date. But again, that's become far more accessible. Uh, we had a new welfare officer contact me yesterday. They're on a course on Monday. That will be shown by Wednesday and they're good to go. So that process itself has been improved. But yeah, unfortunately, the welfare officer has to do those three things plus a DBS. But your no, other committee members only have to have the online safeguarding for committee members. They don't have to have a DBS unless they are in consistent contact with under 18s. Uh, Jill, okay. just, oh, yeah, sorry, just oh. yeah, I was just, I, I think I got some uh, inconsistent information from your team last year on that, um, where they, they were saying that, you know, if you had the welfare officer workshop, then you didn't need to do safeguarding. It, it, it definitely has to be, um, definitely. Okay. Um, okay, right, Jill, sorry, does the welfare officer have to produce a formal report for the AGM? Jill, that is a great, great point. And Claire is going to give me a wrap across the knuckles tomorrow if she sees this, because I should have raised that. In your committee meetings, I would recommend, and in fact, I think I did have safeguarding report on there. I would recommend having an agenda point for a safeguarding report or welfare officers' comments. And again, at the AGM, a safeguarding report or welfare officers' comments, because let's get safeguarding at the heart of everything. Let's put it to the fore and show everyone that it is at the heart of our club. Um, and it is really important because you can raise you can raise some really important issues there that might be poor practice and we can nip that in the bud so it doesn't become um, the next level up that requires action. Um, so I would absolutely recommend that as best practice within your committee meetings, within your AGMs to have a safeguarding report, ideally from your welfare officer. And again, most of it is just going to be it could be qualification wise. But it might be actually this is happening a little bit. Um, we're not supervising the dismissal of our players. It's a busy car park. That is a risk. So moving forward as a club, we are going to ensure that we see a parent leave, a child leave with the parent. That is how we dismiss players at this club would be an example maybe of a conversation that would happen at a committee meetings. So Jill, absolutely. Um, Claire said, can you still do the renewal free online? So I did mention that a moment ago, but that has changed. It's no longer safeguarding children workshop it's safeguarding children course it's every two years and it is online every time 
So you don't do a face to face and then three years later, a refresher online. It's online and then two years later online and then two years later online. So um, again, far more accessible for coaches. Um, right, I'm just going to check. I've not missed any other questions. Can we pay first aid? Who's put that Dawn? Yes, I'll be sending the presentation out as usual. I'll send a recording link to um, and I'll also maybe put a form in for some uh, opportunity to tell us what you want next. OK, it's last orders. Any further questions or anything you want clarified? I'm so pleased I didn't have to answer a COVID question. That has made my day. Absolutely. I'll give it another 10, 20 seconds, and if not, we will bring the meeting to a close. Before I do that, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, or joining me, my team aren't here, for joining us tonight. Um, these meetings are a great way for you to share best practice, for us to kind of plant some seeds and support you to kind of get to where, not where we want you to be, but where you as clubs need to be and want to be. So um, thank you again for joining us. Linda, your hands popped up. Linda, do you want to unmute? Yeah, sorry. I'm not very good with this technical stuff. Um, it is a COVID question. I'm really sorry. Um, will there be um, any updates on what's just been released for clubs regarding COVID? In, term, in what do you mean in terms of um, the, what they call Next. Is it the next stage? Have we got a new stage out? Yeah, hold on. I was on this. So yeah, so as of May 17th on Monday, um, I'll put the link to what's what the FA uh, what the FA are outlining. Right. Um, but there's no massive changes. Most of it is around spectators um, and indoor hospitality and indoor football. But in terms of your procedures around social distancing around managing the match day and training, cleaning of equipment, separation of subs, um, that type of stuff is to continue uh, for the time being. Uh, but that links in there, that gives you kind of the um, the headlines and then the document at the bottom goes into a bit more detail. Um, I'll be happy if you want to spend some time on that tomorrow or another day, I'll be happy yes. to go through that. But the documents, um, each time they do one, it improves. So the, the wording is fairly, fairly strong. But the key changes, indoor football for adults is now permitted. Indoor hospitality is now permitted and spectators are permitted um, following all government rules on legal gatherings. So we don't have to mess about with public and private sites. Thank God for that. And uh, that was that was a tough two weeks. I'm not going to lie. For us, that's been horrendous because we have a lot ground. Yeah. And and three minutes away, they've had an unlocked ground. We over four or five hundred spectators, and the same teams playing on both grounds. Yeah. It's uh, been uh, to... Now it's come to an end. I think we can all agree that that was quite <laughs> a interesting approach to it. I can see why, but it was very, very difficult for clubs like you to police, and it was unfair. Not it was unfair to re to ask you to have to do that. It was very, very tough. So especially when, we had to, especially when we had two FA officials arrive on one day at the same game, uh, Tom. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> okay, so I've put that link in for you, Linda. And if there's anything yeah, in there you're unsure of, give me a bell, um, and I'll Thank I'll be happy to speak through it with you. Thanks. Last chance, everybody. Any questions? If not, I will bring the meeting to an end. And again, thank you very much for joining me tonight. If there is any uh, anything you want us to do moving forward, please do get in touch. Uh, right. Awesome. Right, I'm going to close the meeting off. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Bye-bye.